Good morning everyone. What a privilege it is for us as a church to gather together in the Sunday morning through this virtual platform. I'm excited this morning to preach and as a family to meditate the word of God. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we want to thank you this morning for the gift of life that you've given to us as an opportunity to learn your word. Lord, as we are thirsty this morning, let your living water quench our heart. Lord, we pray that the word that's bread of life, that will fill our hungry souls. Lord, we pray that as we meditate your word, that you will touch our lives through your word and transform us, O oh Father. We humble ourselves and we ask in the most precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Once again, a very good morning. What a, an awesome privilege it is that we've been studying the book of Nehemiah. Let us start this uh, meditation with the reading of the scripture from chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other town. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. And these are the chief province who lived in Jerusalem in the towns of Judah. Everyone lived on his property in their towns, Israel, the priests and the Levites and the temple servants and the descendants of Solomon's servants. Now, we saw in the chapter 10 that there is a revival that has taken place. How the people of Israel has reprioritized everything in their life as a nation, as a family, as a community, as an individual, how they realize the difference between the vital things and the urgent things, how they set their goals on the Lord and how they understood the importance of fellowship with the body and how it is important to be separated in the world. And also how it is important to observe the day of the Lord. So this commitment that they have made was manifested physically through their written agreement and through their signing off. So the book spoke a lot about the first six chapters on the construction of wall. But when you come to 8 to 10, it talks about a spiritual revival that's happening. And 11 to 13, it's primarily talking about the organization of the community. What is happening inside the wall now is the primary or the core lesson that we need to look at it from 11 to 13. This morning, I would like to talk to you under the title, How Do We Serve God? How do we serve God? No, let me give you a brief context first. Though now the city walls are being repaired, rebuilt and restored, now Yerushalayim is still remained as a place that is unpopular, desolate. It is not a place to live. So why is it? If you look at Nehemiah chapter number 2 verse 3, when king was asking, why is your face is so sad? For which the Nehemiah said, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad? When the city, my place of my father's graves lies in ruin, its gates have been destroyed by fire. So this clearly shows that the city was completely desolated, completely burned and brought to its ruins. If you look at the same chapter in the 17th verse, you will see that he says this. Uh, then I said to him, you see the trouble are in how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. We may no longer suffer derision, meaning that these two verses clearly shows us how unpopular this city has become. A city that is 
no use has become a place of uh, uh, no inhabitation gates were burned down the temple was completely destroyed the city was not populated the housing is still inadequate safety was still a concern income was questionable at all point this is one part of what's happening in the city and the over to the topping all these things the city was uh, to a point brought to shame and disgrace the city of Jerusalem was known to other nations as God guiding the people. They are the book of the people. These are the people, those who seen the hand of God. But now here is the city that lies in ruins. So now the city is now described as a city that is of reproach, insult, scorn and taunt and defilement and defied city. In this utter total disgrace and shame even though the wall was built though the city is wanting to see a change people were still hesitant unwilling to go and to reside in this city so in modern terms if you ask me this is a city we should call as a place of wasteland or a ghost town so the whole text in uh, 1 till 10th chapter, it talks about how bad the city was and how things are getting to change. Now, in chapter 12, you see the community and the leadership wants to repopulate this broken, burnt city. They want to bring people inside. So it wasn't done because there is better opportunities are found in the city. It was not because uh, life is going to be more comfortable in that city. Uh, neither it was not a land that has been occupied by the ancestors, so we need to go back. No. The primary reason for them to repopulate, rebuild, reestablish, and regenerate everything is to worship that one true God. A people that walked away from God is now coming back to that God. So why, why would they want to do this? Now the central idea here is that uh, the, in the Old Testament, Jerusalem was a place where the temple was located and built. Prayers were offered in this particular city. God would demonstrate his forgiveness and justice and grant them help and showed mercy and grace from this temple when people cried out unto him. So this was a place where God met his people. Its kavod, his glory was there in the temple. Now you see, this is extremely important. So repopulating and reestablishing, rebuilding is extremely important for both God and for his people. So there is a very close relationship between the land and worship. So when the people contaminated their worship by worshipping idols and removed God from the picture, God removed them out of their way because they compromised with the Creator. They give a second place to God. But because God was a zealous God, because God is very concerned about His people, He doesn't want to take the second place. So He chased them out. And that's what you will read it in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 to 50 onwards. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, if you are angry with them and give them to enemy, and it goes on to say that you will put them in the land of the enemy. But if they turn their hearts, if they repent, if they plead, you will bring them back. And that's what God did to this people of bringing these people from the captivity of Babylon after many years to their own land under the leadership of of different leaders of uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, and Zerubbabel. So now here is the big picture that we see. We see that uh, these are the beloved people of God who walked away from God and God gave them into the hands of the enemies. Now they 
commit themselves to give priority to God and now God is re-establishing by bringing them back to the land but as they have come back to the land now they want to repopulate and re-establish and rebuild the entire city now it's a time for to make choices and commitments are now so far the wall existed for the people now the people is existing for the wall meaning what in the sense are now to move into this land or to be inside this wall, this community needs to make a big sacrifice. Now look at this. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem and the rest of the people cast lots to bring out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other town. Let's look at verse 1 in detail. Now here we find there are two groups of people. The group number one is a group where the names are chosen by a lot. Lot. You cast a lot and you pick a person's name and then those persons are selected. These are people who were drafted and going to do their duty and to move inside the city. By the way, casting a lot is one of the legitimate ways to find the will of God in the Old Testament. So reading in Proverbs 16.33, you will see the lot may be casted, but the decision of it comes from the Lord. So this was a common practice that was handled often by the priest who was seeing or looking to God for directing their ways. But today as Christians in the New Testament, we don't depend on these ascertained ways to direct uh, our will or uh, the, we don't depend on God to do these kind of uh, practices to know the will of God. We have Holy Spirit in us and he is the one through his word, through his conviction and through his guidance taking us over every circumstances. So nevertheless, we should be always not limit what can God do in our life. But the ultimate point is that to it is a matter of trusting God for guidance. So this is a group of people. The first group of people cast up the lords to know the guidance of God in directing their ways in how to bring people inside to repopulate. But there is a second group of people. There is a second group of people who said, I don't need to move to the city, but I'm going to do it. No matter whatever happens, I'm going to be inside it. I'm going to volunteer myself. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be obeying. I'm going to be serving. The Lord, I'm going to be inside. Nobody told them, but they had to do it. Nobody said you have to be inside, but they said, because we love Jerusalem, because we love God, because we love our city and people, we have to be inside. They were willing to sacrifice their homes, their comfort to move inside the city. A city that has no prospect, a city that was in desolation, a city that was burned, but they said, we will move inside the city. They were willing to clean the rubble with their hands, build a house and rebuild again the holy city of God. No compulsion, but they're willing to decide to step inside the uncomfortable zone. You know, the word that is used here is fascinating. If you look at the original text in the, in the Hebrew text, you will see the word used here is this nadav. Which means an uncompelled free movement to do divine service or sacrifice. This word occurs three times primarily in three different contexts. The first context is there when the temple was built, uh, you know, the first time. There were people who willingly gave their entire contributions to build the tabernacle the first time. Offerings were given voluntarily. The second is the Temple of Solomon. You see that in uh, Chronicles and uh, different parts of Kings. You see, you see that people decided to give voluntarily. There was a time they need to say, stop it. Don't give. Enough. And the third time was Deborah when she was asking people to come to fight for the war, holy war. You see in Judges chapter 5, people are willingly came there. That's exactly the same word you see here in Nehemiah chapter 11. When there was a, there was a choice that given people committed themselves to serve God. How do we serve God? Willingly. Such a great example of these leaders leading the people in forefront. 
But serving the Lord requires two things. It's not easy to serve God. All the people whom you see nowadays say, accept the Lord Jesus and uh, your life is filled with a bed of roses. No! Or to serve God is not you're going to you know, get to become filthy rich. No! Serving God requires two things. One, serving God needs courage. And serving God requires you to move even to uncomfortable positions of life. People were afraid. They were skeptical. They were uncomfortable to move to the city. But what did the leaders do first here? You see the first group of people, they showed by willingly moving inside the city. Their second group of people casted the Lord and came inside the city. They committed themselves. They involved themselves. They showed to the people who they are and how much they love God and their city. They didn't want to be leaders who were only asking others to make uncomfortable choices. They were the ones who took the initiative and showed them the way. Uh, back in the days when I was a seminary student, I used to attend a Bible study in the church nearby. During the time of that particular Tuesday, when we were going around 6.30 as an entire college student body, we used to see a lot of young and old people, a lot of them, a lot of them, young people, old people, were standing different parts of the church. There will be a group that will be standing there to welcome the people. There used to be some who used to be ushering by tea or coffee. There used to be others who used to be uh, cleaning the benches and tables and arranging. And there used to be some people distributing the notes. And I used to talk to them. And I used to talk to them and ask them, Sir, what do you do? And to my surprise, all of them are CEOs and high rank executives, police officers, business entrepreneurs, and the leaders of the city. They're not going to get any paycheck for doing those things in the church. It's not, it's not comfortable for them to stand from 6 o'clock till 9 o'clock in the evening being old. But still they welcome with a smile. They happily serve. It was very strenuous to clean the entire church, but they still do it. Why? Because they love the church and the body and the people. Because they love, because of their passion for God, they serve. Serving God requires you to move from comfortable to uncomfortable positions sometimes. And it needs courage. I know people who study in the seminary, if they ask, what do you want to do? And do you want to go to serve God to different states of India? They say, no. They're scared. Or to move outside their comfortable zone. They say, no. The church is not an organization. Church is about a body, which we even looked at it in the last week. It's about the people, serving people. It's an assembly of believers who have been called and gifted and to be commissioned to be obedient servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should not forget that serving is an act of obedience. It is part of the spiritual growth and disciplining process within the body. That's what you see here. When people were selected, when people were willing, they just moved inside the city. They just came inside the city. They know what is up ahead for them? They know what prospect they are going to expect. But still they were willing to move inside. The problem with most of us is either we are skeptical about the decisions that we make for God. Or we are not willing to be moving. We are complacent. We are happy within the body. We are happy. Now when I say serving, I am not talking only about the pastors or uh, those who are serving as a full-time minister, when I say serving, it includes, it's an inclusive term. There's a lot of things that is involved in serving or obedience. There's a lot of things involved in that. For many, there is a lack of concern about strengthening the body of Christ. They are content to go to the church without functioning as part of the church. Because it is the responsibility of each and every individual in the society, each and every individual in the church to help each other through their giftedness. Because we need the others and others need us. That we really don't understand at times. So the truth for us this morning, 
for people those who are listening through this youtube and through the various other platform is that can do the same for the lord and people around us very community that we live in you have to be willing you have to be courageous you have to be willing to move to the uncomfortable centers and faces of life willing to accept the mission of god that god in his will and in his purpose that he puts us in if we if we have to contextualize this morning in in this morning if you want to contextualize if god is asking you to go to a place to share people will be hesitating people will be having a second thoughts but if god is asking any of us to go to a wealthy country people are immediately yes sir let's go if god calls you would you obey that word and to serve and understand his need and go it would mean that forsaking the idea of comfortable life it would be abandoning your ambitions it would be abandoning and moving away from your family maybe sometimes it would be starting from scratch it would be a new place so many other things that i can give on and on and on but the question is how do we serve god how do we how do we fulfill this command of god asking us to build the kingdom of god what do we do we serve god by willingly accepting his command willingly moving to the uncomfortable faces of life willing to be courageous not to be complacent but to strengthen the body when we understand this principle we'll be able to touch the lives of many in india and around the world if you look at the biggest example in the old testament is the forefather or the patriarch abraham do you think he is the biggest loser or a biggest winner i would definitely say he was the biggest winner you know why because god says that he himself said that he was very proud of him he was not ashamed to be his god that was an astonishing statement of appreciation because he abandoned everything that he gained how awesome is it imagine somebody maybe your boss or your ceo comes to you and say i'm so proud to have you as an employee i'm so proud to have you because in the sake of losing everything he gained everything abraham he was willing to be courageous he was willing to move from the position of known to the unknown trusting in god how do we serve god how do we see people serving god is trusting god guided by god and willing to take the risk of life so we understand in this first two verses of 11th chapter the reestablishment that was happening in the city it was not just a political necessity not a religious or a military necessity but was a spiritual necessity but for that people need to be there so people was willing to serve this god people loved god and his work more than anything else This morning the question is that do you love your god do you love his people you know one of the things that i remember right now is that uh, one of the rabbis used to say that uh, if this uh, morning if you are working in an office uh, if your boss is on leave uh, the way you behave in your cabin and the way you conduct yourself will be totally different from the way your awareness of him being present in the office on that day because if he is present then you will be very silent the way you respond will be very professional the way you handle things will be very soft and calm because that awareness impact your experience right so as that we need to be aware that our god who is sovereign who is the ultimate creator of this world is above us he is watching over us and he has given us the purpose of life and every individual is called to be the servants of the lord jesus christ 
to go to the nation and preach and serve the word of God. How do that happen? When we were willing to serve God. When we take the step of courage. When we are willing to move to the uncomfortable faces of life. When that happens, nations will see God. People will understand God. People will know God through our lives. So how do we do that? So we need to transform our personal mindset of what will I get to how can I give. People were not interested what will they get when they go inside the city. They were thinking primarily what can they give to the city and the people. Their concern was not about them. It's what about the nation and what about the people. Second is that how can my giftedness not only turn to become a blessing for the people around me. In modern terms that would be how can my giftedness develop disciples who in turn becomes the disciples of the Lord Jesus. We need to keep thinking on those lines. Intentionally we need to create a culture of believers who are thankful for their salvation who are passionate about serving God uh, and use their giftedness and their abilities because they are, have a purpose in God. I want to close it by telling you a story about it's a very imaginative story but I wanted to make a point here it was a story of Jesus returning back to the heavens when he arrived the angels were glad and they were excited to see him one of the angels exclaimed uh, and he said, Jesus, we're so glad that you come back. Is your work on earth is completed or not? Jesus responded, no, there's no more work to be done. The angel asked Jesus politely, so who do you think will finish the work? Jesus, for which politely replied, my plan is to assign the work that needs to be done to those who believe in me. That's my servants who are willing to serve the angel thought for a minute and said, but what if the plan doesn't work? What if the people don't serve? What's your other plan? Then Jesus said, there is no other plan because my servants will be always willing to serve. My people will always think about me and the kingdom. The church doesn't need people who are wanting to think about what they can get from the church. But we need a generation who is passionate about God who is passionate about his kingdom and willing to contribute, willing to give their giftedness and abilities and skills and talents so that the body is built. Revival comes only when we love God, love his work and love his people. When we live under this awareness, great things will happen in the nation that we live. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful time that you've given to us. Lord, as we meditated this morning, we see a group of people who know for sure that there are no prospects in the city. The city that lies in ruins, the city that is desolate, city that has no prospects. But yet, they were willing to move and reside in the city. Willing to understand that there is a greater cause. Willing to work for the people. Lord, help us this morning as a church to always prioritize and think it's not about us, it's about the kingdom. It's about the nation, it's about people. Lord, we are placed in the different scope of limitations, O oh Lord, but we pray that our commitment, our priority, when it becomes you, when you become the center, Lord, nations, will come and know you, O Lord. We thank you for this powerful word. We humble ourselves in the Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you.